Muy buenos días. Welcome. It's certainly a pleasure to have all of you here join us this morning. Uh, we thank you for, for being here. Muchísimas gracias. My name is Avidan Rodriguez. I'm the Provost Vice President here at UT Pan American. And we're simply delighted that all of you decided to join us today uh, to continue what is an ongoing and continuing conversation about the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. And so we expect to have a conversation with you today about UTRGV, the progress that's been made and next steps as we move towards opening uh, for the first time the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley in the fall of 2015 and the medical school in the fall of 2016. So once again, thank you all for being here. It is really today our pleasure and our honor to have on stage uh, three distinguished, and I don't want to call them guests because they're no longer guests. They're part of the family. They've been coming down to the Rio Grande Valley and now for a very long time, and, and you know them all. Let me first start by introducing our Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Pedro Reyes, a native of the Rio Grande Valley who has worked incredibly hard uh, to move uh, forward uh, the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. So, Pedro, thank you for being here with us. Another person who was recently introduced to us, but very well known now throughout the Rio Grande Valley, uh, the founding president for the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, Dr. Guy Bailey. Congratulations, Dr. Bailey, and thank you uh, as well for being with us today. And finally, one who has really been a champion uh, for the Rio Grande Valley, one who has been a champion uh, for UT, the University of Texas, really bringing the University of Texas for the past few years to a whole different level, not only in the state of Texas, but nationally and internationally as well, with a focus on promoting excellence in teaching and scholarship research and service, and really bringing to light the contributions of the University of Texas system, and one who has pioneered and has championed uh, the creation and the development of the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, someone who is extremely, extremely committed uh, to the Rio Grande Valley and to UTRGV and is watching very carefully uh, for the success of UTRGV. Please help me welcome to the podium our Chancellor, the Chancellor of the UT system, Dr. Francisco Cigarroa. Well, Javidan, thank you very much for uh, that very warm welcome. And since Javidan said, uh, buenos dias and good morning, I'm going to say, como amanecieron. <laughs> 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 um, well, first of all, uh, as always, uh, what a privilege it is for me to walk you know, to this wonderful campus, into this wonderful campus, UT Pan American. And what a privilege it has been for me over you know, the past five and a half years uh, to really get to know all of you. Uh, all of you are, are familiar faces. And, you know, we see each other here. We see each other in Austin. We see each other in Washington with the wonderful Mariachi group of the University of Texas Pan Am. So I do feel like I'm a part of this community. I also want to, again, and will always emphasize this is my deepest appreciation for President Robert Nelson. Uh, I, again, before all of you, want to thank you uh, and thank him for his outstanding service and for his stewardship of this great university. Remarkable things have happened under his leadership. Working with President Nelson for the past four and a half years has been an honor. It has been an opportunity to learn from someone who has been so passionate about this region and who has really emphasized every moment of his professional life, and I would say even his, his life, you know, really to students. So his, pa his passion, his dedication, and his zeal have been impressive and inspiring to me, and I have learned much from President Nelson. A few of us also uh, will ever forget Robert's passionate address to the Board of Regents in support of a new university and medical school in the Valley. We thank him for his advocacy for the University of Texas at Rio Grande Valley and his enthusiastic participation in the planning process. Again, 
we would not be here today without the leadership of President Nelson and President Garcia. A little bit about President Garcia, uh, our UT Brownsville president, as well as uh, UT Pan American uh, President Robert. Uh, they will be fully engaged in their new roles with the University of Texas system, uh, effective September the 1st. So yes, at this time, we are in a transition period, but at the same time, you know, walking through a transition really basically elevates our attention to make sure that we're particularly paying attention to dotting every I and crossing T's and trying to do our part in communication, communication, and communication. Uh, President Nelson has agreed to remain at the University of Texas Pan American as a tenured faculty member and serve as a special advisor to the University of Texas system. Quite simply, UT system needs Robert Nelson's expertise and we're so proud that he's willing to help us through this process. Last month, I announced that President Julieta Garcia has been selected to serve as the executive director of a newly created University of Texas Institute of the Americas, which will establish a strong bicultural and binational presence centered in this region of our state. In some ways, um, I think I like my temp the temperature a little bit better over here. Uh, it'll mimic uh, the Aspen Institute and other scholarly institutes which foster the discussion of ideas and searches for solutions in education and policy issues. So my, I envision this institute you know, as an important aspect of UT RGV and, and also really seeing this institute as a method of you know, bringing thought leaders but also mentoring you know, young faculty and first time generation students that you know, with hard work, with coming to UT RGV, with getting a higher education, you can fulfill your dreams. And I'd like to prepare the future academic leaders of this country uh, in, in some part as a result of this institute, but also our statewide leaders and national leaders who need to understand you know, some of the most uh, important questions that need to be asked of, of America. Uh, at the same time, uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, Alan Arbides, uh in the sense that uh, while we are acknowledging transitions, I want to take this opportunity uh, to also thank uh, the Provost Alan Arbides for his many years of distinguished service as an educator and as an administrator and scholar, not only at UT Brownsville since 2009, but also as a as a member of outstanding institutions of higher learning in the United States and Canada. Again, our provost, both here at Pan Am and our provost at UT Brownsville, have been integral in really bringing our working groups together uh, to basically get to this transition of obtaining accreditation uh, for UT RGV. Uh, provost Arbutis has showed outstanding vision and leadership during the challenging process to separate UTB and TSC, and we thank him for his hard work. He has announced his upcoming retirement, and I will wish him the best of luck, and I will forever thank him you know, for his remarkable leadership in a very difficult unwinding of a 20-year partnership. And then, if that wasn't enough, we asked Alan you know, to help us in you know, creating a new university uh, which comprises the medical school of the UT Pan American campus and the UT Brownsville campus. So, um, you know, great work. Now, in its day-to-day -day operations, uh, UT Brownsville and the University of Texas Pan American will need strong presidential leadership until UT Rio Grande Valley achieves its accreditation. And so today, I'm announcing that we've selected two outstanding interim presidents to serve during this time of transition, such that uh, when UTRGV gets accredited, then you know, essentially they've provided the leadership with all of you to prepare the handoff uh, to the president of UTRGV, which is Dr. Guy Belly. Uh, William R. Fannin uh, will serve as president at interim at the University of Texas at Brownsville. And Javidan Rodriguez will serve as president at interim at the University of Texas Pan American. Where's Javidan? <laughs> I 
I got goosebumps. I think we made the right choice. <laughs> but what have you done for me lately, Avedon? <laughs> um, all of us know Dr. Rodriguez really well, and he is currently provost and vice president for academic affairs at the University of Texas Pan American and is a tenured professor in the Department of Sociology. Previously, he served as deputy president at the provost at the University of Delaware. Havadon, I want to just personally thank you for taking on this responsibility, uh, for st helping us steward this process uh, to create uh, and establish a, a fantastic accredited UTRGV, um, and ready to be on the team. And, and for that, uh, I'm so grateful you've taken on this responsibility. And as chancellor of the University of Texas system, I have extreme confidence in you. As for UT Brownsville, uh, we have asked uh, Bill Fannin uh, to serve as an interim of the University of Texas at Brownsville. A little bit about Dr. Fannin. Uh, he has served as provost and vice president for academic affairs for UT Permian Basin since 1996. And prior to that role, Dr. Fannin was the dean of the College of Business at Idaho State University. This level of leadership, in my opinion, is required by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools, which as we all know, is the main accrediting entity for the universities in this region of the United States. They require each campus to have its independent presidents, and these presidents will be empowered as such. Effective on the day that President Nelson and President Garcia stepped down. So right now, um, you know, Havadon is provost, Robert Nelson is president, but on the day of effectuation, you know, the transfer power will occur. As I've stated, and just to emphasize this again, the interim presence will start uh, in early August uh, to ensure a smooth transition for the beginning of the 2014-2015 academic year. We anticipate the interim present roles to end shortly after UG, UT RGV achieves its accreditation. So I don't want there to be any ambiguity in who, who is you know, the president. Uh, the president today is Robert Nelson until you know, he officially uh, transitions into his new role at UT system and the same for President Garcia. Uh, there can be no ambiguity on that front and we support both presidents immensely. The role of the interim presidents will be twofold. Uh, their first priority will be to ensure the highest quality of day-to-day -day operations at the existing institutions and to assure that we're following all policies and, and making certain that you know, we're operating like an institution of the first class. Uh, their second priority will be to work closely with President Guy Bailey and his transition team in launching the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. The interim presidents will assume the same level of authority granted to the current presidents as provided by state laws, by regents' rules, and UT system policies. And the interim presidents will also preside over events such as the 2015 commencement ceremonies. Well, as we all know, uh, the upcoming 2014-15 academic year will be a historic transitional year and a most exciting time for the Valley. We want the university communities and the citizens of this beautiful region to share with the excitement and to help us create an outstanding university and medical school. We all know that there is still much, much more work to be done before we open the doors of UTRGV in the fall of 2015. I wanna thank all the faculty, all the staff, and all the students and administrators who are fully engaged in making UTRGV a success. And I also again want to tell you that we work, uh, my whole leadership taught us to work as a team and to be able to you know, basically walk through the different challenges that we have working as a team, but also you know, when we don't have the answers to the questions that you know, we look into them and we continually communicate with each other. Well, Guy Bailey, the new president of UTRGV, um, is with us today. Uh, this is not his usual attire. I've got to read you this text. All right. Let me just find it. It's a terrific text. 
Let's see. Oh, there he is. Hi, Chancellor. I have a problem. <laughs> I made it into Austin tonight, but my clothes did not. I can either go tomorrow in jeans and tennis shoes or not go. Which do you suggest? And sorry <laughs> to be a problem. My response to him was, Guy, was that a turbulent flight? You mean you're not wearing any clothes? <laughs> in all seriousness, I said, go in jeans and tennis shoes. People will love it. And Guy, we love it. Now, I would not recommend you going to the Board of Regents your first day that way. <laughs> Actually, we were comparing notes. I said, Guy, what is your suit size? I said, hey, I think my suit will fit you. <laughs> so if that happens to you in Austin, just knock on my door. I'll lend you a suit. Well, we all know a Guy pretty well. He's a seasoned educator and administrator in higher education. And, and I, I'm so pleased. And I know from the center of my heart that we're so fortunate that the University of Texas Board of Regents selected him as the founding president of our new University of Texas institution. Guy has served as provost of UTSA, and I had firsthand experience uh, in working with Guy in establishing the San Antonio Life Sciences Institute uh, and redeveloping you know, a far better and stronger and sustainable relationship with, between UT Health Science Center San Antonio and UTSA, and I believe the entire community in the state have benefited from that collaboration. Uh, Dr. Beatty also has served as president of Texas Tech University, which is again, you know, one of our other great universities in the state, and as president of the University of Alabama. So we have a very seasoned, experienced, well-guided individual to lead us into the future at UTRGV. So I'm personally very happy to just return to Texas with clothes or without. <laughs> uh, so please welcome Guy Bailey. Uh, first, what I'd like to do is spend uh, the bulk of the time answering questions from you, any questions that you might have. But before I do, uh, I want to assure my boss, our region here, <laughs> region I would say, I don't dress like this normally. So. <laughs> hey, you, you know, uh, when your clothes you don't show up, your boss always does. So what, what can I say? <laughs> but uh, uh, Javadon Rodriguez, I, I want to uh, congratulate him as well. I've had a chance to work with him pretty closely the last few weeks. Uh, I've been very impressed. He's, uh, he's, he's smart, knowledgeable, knows higher education has good skills with people, you, you'll really enjoy having him, I think, as, uh, as your interim president, and I know I'll enjoy working with him. Uh, Chancellor, thank you always for everything you do, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, Chancellor, uh, it, it, I think all of you know how important this project is to him. He is, uh, he is from the valley, maybe not this part of the valley, valley but still, the, and, and so this is an important Thing for him, the success of this project is is absolutely crucial to him, and I, and I think also to the entire board of regents uh, and to the entire UT system. Uh, just a couple of other quick comments. I, I've been on the job ten days now, so <clears throat> uh, enough to know a little bit, but not a lot. That we're what we're doing right now is planning the structure of the new university, and is that structure as we make decisions about that, uh, we'll release that information going forward. And most of you know the process for hiring faculty is already under, uh, that uh, you've already begun that process and you know about that. <clears throat> there will be a process for staff as well and we anticipate beginning that early this fall and moving forward in a very timely fashion there. Uh, and again, we can't, uh, as the, as the structure of the university is laid out, 
then we can begin making decisions about that. And I'll make sure that, uh, uh, that you know as we move forward with hiring, and I'm going to focus a little bit on staff right now, the move forward in hiring staff, <clears throat> we're going to have to prioritize some things. Some things are going to have to come first. For, for example, first thing we're going to have to do is get the enrollment management piece in place. We have to recruit students, right, and be able to admit students. And that has to be done first. So we'll, we'll do hiring in that area first, and then we'll move, move forward in a timely manner. But uh, I'll try to keep you posted uh, each step along the way as we make determinations about structure, and we'll go from there. Now, if you have specific questions, I would be more than happy to, uh, to answer those, and, and that's uh, to the extent that I can. I may not know, and if I, don't, if I say I don't know the answer, I'm being honest with you, I, I don't, and I'll explain why. But questions from, uh, from the audience. I know Dr. Cigarro, I always have to bring you the, the tough questions, but you've been, <laughs> been good at answering them. Um, it's seemingly more questions than answers. And so uh, what, what I think a lot of people are wanting to know is uh, it's very unclear what the timeline is. You know, is there, is there more definity in the uh, de definition of the timeline, especially, you know, we've heard, this is the first I've heard about staff, so that's a good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of, of faculty, we know something's going to happen in September. When do we expect to know what the organizational structure is? Um, timeline. That, that's a big Guy, question. Guy, do you want to take a crack at that since you've been thinking I, I about will. that? I will. The organizational structure, we'd like to have <clears throat> information out in early August about organizational structure. Again, I don't, I don't want to pin myself down to an exact date, but that's what we're discussing. That's what's being discussed right now. And uh, as we move into July, we, uh, that, that'll be the focus of what we discuss, how we put the organization together. And we'd like to get that information out. We'll get it out as soon as possible, but we, we certainly got a target date of, of, of early August there. And as that structure becomes clear, then we can move forward with, uh, with, staff, with staff hiring. And so that will determine, for example, some of the the levels of positions and com kinds of positions we have. But I, I would like to be more specific. It's just that's where we are uh, at this point. And after 10 days, that's kind of kind of where I am. And, but I, I, after 30 days, I hope we'll have much more clarity about that. But we'll keep you posted. Thank you, just, you know, in response to that as well, I, I, you know, it, it's hard for me to provide more specificity than you did, Guy. But you know, from, from my perspective and from a Board of Regents perspective, it's why we were so adamant about really sticking to our timeline in selecting a president of UTRGV. You know, at the end of the day, you know, the president working with, you know, our, our added room presidents and our current presidents, you know, really now have to start getting the work done of being able to communicate, you know, with all of you in a short period of time, you know, what are actually well thought out timelines. And, and again, now that we have Dr. Bailey here, you know, who's basically going to be living here and thinking about this 24-7, uh, through his leadership, we will be able to provide you much more specificity uh, because it'll be well thought out through the president of UTRGV and the presence of Pan Am and Brownsville to start moving this forward. We also don't want to be giving you misinformation. And, and so that's why, you know, from my perspective, it was paramount that we recruited an outstanding president of UTRGV as soon as possible. I'm grateful to our board for sticking with the timeline. Good morning. I'm Babette Morgan. I'm the faculty senate president of UTB. I'm Dora Saavedra. I am the chair elect of the faculty senate here at uh, UTPA. Welcome, Dr. Bailey, thank and you. thank you, Chancellor Sigueroa Pedro Reyes and Board of Regents for selecting uh, wonderful interim presidents for our two institutions. Uh, we'd like to ask a question about, uh, that we get from faculty all the time. The transition team was named very recently, and the main question we got from our faculty was, when will faculty be included in 
either the transition team or some of the transition processes? Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a good question as well. It, as the transition team meets, what we'll begin to do is uh, look very quickly at who needs it, at how, what people we need to involve very quickly in decision making. So it should be very quickly. Remember, the, uh, there is a timeline, by the way, for hiring faculty, and we'll, we'll stick uh, strictly to that, that timeline. And as that timeline evolves, we'll bring more and more faculty into the process. So, uh, but the transition team is not everybody who will be planning the transition. It's just a group of people that can come together and advise me about how we need to move forward, what resources, human resources and so forth we have for doing that, and we can go from, from there. So I guess a follow-up question to Bob Betts uh, would be, um, you know, as we move forward through this year, uh, I think we all know how important uh, shared governance is and, and how sure. important our faculty senates are. And, uh, you know, I guess a question would be, you know, for me to you, um, which I think is a little bit related, Bob, Bet, is that as you are moving forward over this time, you know, will, will there be an opportunity for this transition team to also hear input from our respective governance groups? Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. Ab absolutely. And, you know, many of the, many of the decisions you can't put in a curriculum without your faculty. I mean, there are a lot of things that just can't be done. Uh, but we want faculty input and, and staff input as well as we go all along. So uh, hearing your voice as we put this together, very important. And, uh, and so we'll be, we'll be listening and, and, and asking. Thank you so much. All I know is thank I couldn't you. have survived as chancellor without your input. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, question here. in manufacturing engineering. Uh, this is to do with staff. Uh, there are several staff members who uh, have, you know, years of experience. And uh, there is the worry that uh, if it's an external search firm that's going to do the search, are they going to, you know, look for the minimum quali uh, uh, qualifications necessary uh, and, you know, take a uh, hire somebody at a lower salary without the experience, you know, uh, whereas this person has been doing the job. Uh, can you just describe uh, what sort of process is going to be used for hiring and selecting staff? Because that, it's of concern to them. It, it, well, that's a good question. And <clears throat> it, some of this depends on the level of staff we're talking about. Uh, we won't for most positions, we won't do national level searches. We certainly will post and, and do interviewing. Are we looking for minimal qualifications? No. It's going to be a very complex institution, and we need people with the highest skill levels and not the lowest skill levels to make this work. Does, does that make sense? So I think what you'll find is that it will be looking for the most skilled people we can get. And I, I said this before, uh, the vast majority of the talent we need for this institution is right, it's already in the Rio Grande Valley. And so <clears throat> we anticipate using the talent we have. There, when we bring in people from the outside, there might be a few, but the vast majority of the talent is right here. And uh, again, we'll, we'll try to use posting processes that expedite hiring. Uh, at the same time, if a job is posted, you know, several of you may apply for that and we'll, uh, we'll go through an inter interview process and make sure people are fairly considered. The end result of this is we're not trying to do this on the cheap. We're not trying to get the least expensive person. We're trying to get the best person. Does that answer the question? Does that make sense? Well, I think I'd just like to follow up on that just a bit. And uh, it was really... Uh, a phrase that Dr. Bailey stated to Pedro and to me, you know, when, you know, questions about staff came out. And, and I thought Dr. Bailey really, you know, put it so well. It's, it's, you know, the staff, you know, is really the glue in a sense that, that keeps the institution moving forward. They have institutional memory. You know, they've served under various administrators. Uh, you know, I can tell you firsthand, administrators like myself, you know, come and go. Uh, but in many ways, you know, a campus has staff that has, you know, really served the institution for decades. 
And, and we've got to basically honor our staff who provide that institutional memory and expertise. That's absolutely true, absolutely. Good morning, welcome. My name is Phil Etheridge. A few weeks ago, a letter went out from our president, Dr. Nelson, announcing a buyout for approximately 100 faculty members that would become effective uh, the end of May of 2015. My question is two parts. First of all, uh, that buyout could be in several million dollars. Uh, so the first question is, where is that money coming from? And the second question that I have is for those of us that will be here for the last year of UT Pan American, from a financial point of view, although there's money for buyouts, what kind of money is there for us for merit raises or other raises for this year? Thank you. Pastor, you want to? Yeah, I, I, you want me to take a stab at that first? The money that's, let me take the second part of the question first and then work backwards. And if I forget part of your question, if you'll remind me. Uh, the, the second part, will there be merit, money for merit raises, raises in your current budget? That I don't know. I'm, uh, again, you have leadership at, at UT Pan American, and uh, I don't know what the budget, budgetary situation of the current institution is, but... The, yeah, that's, in, fa in fact, what we can do is I'll, I'll talk to leadership and get that information for you. Uh, but do you want to, you want to? I'll be happy to, to do it. Uh, Marty, and I think uh, we talked about this uh, uh, with President Nelson. I can't hear you. I'm sorry about that. Here. Um, I think the, there is a plan, and the plan that we have going forward, uh, Marty, correct me if I'm not, uh, if I'm mistaken, there is merit uh, allocated to, to uh, across the board. Is that correct? Uh, For UT Pan Am and 15, no. Okay. All right. Uh, but anyway, we have to look into, uh, we have to look at the budget, we have to look at uh, the everything so that we could make those decisions, and I think President Bailey will be making those decisions in the near future, along with uh, Avidan and, and other folks. So am I correct, the answer was no? There is no fair money for this coming year? The, the only answer I can give you is I don't know yet. Uh, now, I'll work with the leadership you have on campus, and we can figure that out, but I honestly don't know, and that's uh, the, the only honest answer I can give you. As, as we go forward, uh, I'll work with... Uh, uh, Interim President Rodriguez, and then we'll, we'll figure that out. Well, I think the honest answer is that, you know, we're still in the budget, you know, making process. Uh, and basically all 15 presidents, again, the presidents that exist today are empowered to make decisions for the campus. The budget uh, authority is given to the presidents. The presidents basically present their best budget to the executive vice chancellors Ultimately, to me, I'm still in the process of reviewing budgets. Finally, you know, the Board of Regents has to authorize the budget for the system. So we are still basically in the budget-making process, and leadership is continually looking at all of this and having to basically make the best budget under your fiscal responsibilities to advance the campus forward. And again, you know, those are decisions that we empower our presidents to make and then ultimately, we have to review the mid-system, and ultimately, we have to get approval by the board. I mean, that's just the way it works. All right, shifting gears a little bit. Again, welcome, Dr. Bailey. Um, can you speak a little bit about how you see building the culture and what that culture will be at UTRGV? Um, especially coming from two similar yet distinct cultures at UTB, UTRGB, and of course the yet to exist uh, medical, uh, medical school. Well, that's a good question and, and probably the, the biggest challenge. And if you think about merging two cultures, you, you do have two legacy institutions that have done tremendous things and, and you want to honor and respect those. It's very important to recognize <clears throat> that you couldn't be thinking 
about UT RGV if you had not had UT Pan American and UT Brownsville and had they not accomplished what they've accomplished. You can also think about this as one more stage in the evolution of the institutions. Remember, this institution started, what, in the 1920s as a, as a community college? And if you just look at its evolution, it's, it's uh, changed over time. Same thing with Brownsville. And uh, so we're looking at, at another stage in the evolution of the institution. For building the two cultures, I think as we come together as one institution, as you work closely with faculty and staff at UT Brownsville, as, you have, as we have common curriculum, as we have common admissions, as we work for a common goal with students and admitting students working with schools, uh, as you do a common mascot and everything, you know, everything that goes, I think you'll build the culture that way. One of the things that uh, is important for all of us to do is to think valley-wide, think about the entire valley. Remember what happens in Brownsville is just as important as what happens here to you and, it, and going forward it, it very much will be. The same thing, what happens here is just as important there. And so we'll, we'll try to work with people to think about this as one institution, try to bring people together, uh, working on common curriculum, uh, common policies, common, and I think as we do that, you'll find that people will, will set, become one institution, we'll be able to merge those cultures. And again, we'll always do this paying respect to what's gone before. Uh, good morning, Dr. Bailey. I'm Leona Ryan, the current Staff yes. Senate Chair here at Pan Am. Um, and as you can guess, I'll ask another staff question. Um, and you may not have an answer, but I'll ask it anyway, because I know these are a couple of the ones that are pretty popular. Um, do you happen to know at this point if there will, or do you anticipate there being a cutoff or a deadline by which staff would know whether or not they do have a position at UTRGV? And if not, um, or if there is, uh, that would give them ample time maybe to be able to plan before UTPA yeah. closes. Um, and also, uh, do you have an idea yet about what you envision for that hiring process? Who would be responsible for hiring staff? Um, would it be done top down from um, hiring your administration first and then they would fill positions? Or do you anticipate a third party helping with that? No, that's, that's a very good question. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, first of all, on the timeline, our goal is to get that done this fall and to get it done as early in the fall as possible. <clears throat> so what, what we would do, and there isn't a, a necessarily a drop dead date, and, and let me explain why. Some things have to be done first. Uh, 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 Sadiq's over there. You know, we're gonna have a really good office of research, but the hiring for that can come after the hiring for your enrollment management. It, some things have to, just come first in the evolution of the institution. So it won't happen all at once, but we'd like to have it in a relatively short time frame in the fall. Uh, <clears throat> it's possible that we could use a consultant to help us assess some of the HR needs. <clears throat> the hiring itself will be done by the executive team. And again, I'll begin hiring executive team members uh, very, very shortly. And again, as, you, as we begin fleshing out the executive administrative teams, the, the hiring will be done, but the interviewing and hiring will be done, uh, you know, by the uh, but by the UT RGV people, not by a third party. And I think you know the other the other aspect of the question you know, that I heard is, you know, of course, everybody wants to know timelines and you know when <clears throat> communications will roll out and so forth. But but I think you know, part of the question that I heard is, uh, you know. Will staff, you know, have an appropriate timeline, you know, to make plans for their personal self, you know, if for whatever reason, you know, that FTE yeah. or that vacancy slot still doesn't exist, you know, it's it's really how we plan for the future, and you know, we do have to be very sensitive to that. Uh, absolutely, I I think there's no question about that, and that's why we'll try to do that as quickly and as early in the fall as possible. I, I wish I could give you an exact timeline, but I would be. Not, I wouldn't be honest with you if I did. But we are sensitive that people have careers uh, on the line here. And so we want to do that as quickly and as timely a manner as possible with, with full sensitivity to, uh, to the fact that these are people's jobs. 
Hi, I'm um, John Benio. I'm a senior philosophy student here at Pan Am. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm excited about the creation of uh, UTRGV. Uh, however, I'm alarmed that uh, Deloitte has been uh, hired as a, multinational, a private multinational uh, corporation to prepare an institutional design and operational efficiency, efficiency studies that we use as a basis for blueprinting what's supposed to be a public university for the Rio Grande Valley. So my question to you is, what exactly is Deloitte's role, role in uh, the creation of this university? I'd be happy to answer that, that question because I, I hired Deloitte, and not only Deloitte, but other, other entities. Um, the, the, the purpose for Deloitte is to do a study and to advise President Bailey about organizational models. It's not about reduction in force or anything else. It's about how is it that we can best organize this new university? Um, uh, UTPA has done a great job, UT Brownsville has done a great job, but we have to rethink the way we do the new university. Uh, and, 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 and that's the task that they have in, in front of them. And so they will come and say, President Bailey and company and, 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 and others, here's some, some of the best thinking about how you should organize the, 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 the new institution. That's the purpose of it, and that's it, nothing else. I also think that, uh you know, like all consultants or all individuals we hire, uh, these are advisory bodies. Uh, I would say that this would provide important input to the transition working group. Uh, again, uh, you know, part of that is for the transition working group to kind of incorporate this input. Ultimately, you know, the decisions have to be made, you know, by the president. Uh, but we're trying to give and provide, you know, the most thoughtful analytical input, uh, kind of diagnostic tools in a sense, uh, to the leadership to the transition team and ultimately to the president, such that you know, the best decisions you know, can be made. That's right. And Chancellor, just to say, I mean, this, is a, this is a really complex, really complex job. I mean, this is, and, and we just hired President Bailey. We, we couldn't let uh, folks just to say, well, come in and do whatever you want. It's impossible. I mean, you have to get data, information, and, and as the Chancellor said, uh, the president and the, and the teams and faculty and staff will be making those decisions at the end, not Deloitte or Accenture or anybody else. Hello, um, my name is um, Jason Pope and I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department and actually I was quite delighted that you, you wore jeans today. It actually kind of made my day. But, um, my, uh, we match. Let's give him a clap. Uh, but my question is regarding um, teaching loads and uh, as we shift to a more research emphasis, I actually was a, a student for some time at a, another UT uh, system school, UT Arlington, and we were pushing for this thing that I never quite figured out what it actually was or if it was actually a real thing called tier one status. And I do remember professors becoming slightly less accessible, signs being put up on doors saying, you know, not available today because they're in there, you know, writing grants to raise funds for this new uh, status that we're seeking. So I'm wondering is, because time is finite, will there be perhaps reduced teaching loads for those of us who are going to be needing to spend more time uh, doing research, more research activities? Yeah, that's a good question. And at research universities, usually there are different teaching loads. One of the things we want to keep in mind is that uh, <clears throat> the, the same teaching load might not be appropriate for every person. That's something that's decided at the department and the college level. Uh, the, the university will have a sort of a broad policy, but the implementation of that is really what happens at the department and the college level. I, I would like to say something, and uh, I, I just spent the last uh, nine months in the classroom, so uh, I do understand what the demands are there, and, and as a president and chancellor, I taught I as well. We, we don't ever want to lose sight of the fact that our greatest product and, and the greatest thing you ever do is what you do with students. And, you, you know, someone asked me about to once, what was your best publication? What's the best thing you ever did in your research? And, you know, I can tell you what's my favorite, but really the best thing I ever did were the students I produced. And I, I look out right now, some of them are provost and some of them have been presidents. Uh, and they, they've done much more than I could have ever done on my own. So we want to always keep that in mind. And, and I think it's possible 
to, devo to develop a university that balances that. And we'll pay close attention because the success of student, there is no success of an institution without the success of students. So we'll, we'll be sensitive to the fact that, yes, we want to enhance our research significantly. We want to give students an opportunity to be part of that research. We want our students to graduate and get a good education as well. And I think we can do balance, a, a balanced load that will help people do that. It may be implemented in slightly different ways in different disciplines. Uh, but that, that's a very good question. And remember, you have different loads at these two different institutions right now. It, it is a complex problem, and I'm not going to give you a real simplistic answer. But, but it is something we're very sensitive to and will work, will work out. I think just in follow-up, um, you know, again, I don't speak for the campus or you know, uh, the departments and, and colleges, but, but I can speak for kind of the chancellor's, you know, the system's view on teaching and also the board's view on, you know, the mission of teaching. And, you know, that is also front and center, uh, you know, for our board of regents. Uh, we truly value those missions uh, and we don't, you know, want one mission to be at the expense of, of another. And, you know, to Regent Ali Sutherland, I'm personally very proud of the Regents Outstanding Teaching Awards uh, that you provide, of which many faculty from both Pan Am and Brownsville have benefited from that. Um, and I also thank you and the board for challenging us, you know, to make certain that outstanding teachers are also uh, celebrated and put front and center, you know, in, in the successes of the university, because at the end of the day, that is our most important mission, is to educate the future of Texas. Speak from um, from experience. I'm a faculty member at UT Austin right now, and I have uh, at least a $10 million operation in research, and I also teach. And uh, the myth that teaching and research um, should be separate, it's, it's absolutely nonsense. I use my research to teach my students. And, and uh, you know, and, and even at UT Austin, uh, so-called the uh, uh, research university, you have faculty members carrying 24 credit hours or TLCs, so teaching load credits, and have a uh, million dollars of research every year moving forward. And so, so um, I always embrace the students because the students are the most creative in many ways uh, in my research team so that we could push the agenda forward and benefit society in, in many ways. So, but I understand the, the load issue, and, and you have to think about that as well, and, and I think the president will do that as well. There, I will say, I'm a little terrified transitioning from chancellor to faculty because I'm gonna be a bunch of, with a bunch of smart students and they're gonna ask me a lot of questions, so I'm doing my homework right now. <clears throat> By the way, I should also point out, you know, we, we also face budgetary realities <clears throat> and changes in course loads and are things that you may have to phase in over time. Uh, and again, but those are things that when we get everybody uh, to, together, when we, we have one institution and we're organized, we can work through and see what the best fit is for this institution, so. Um, I didn't introduce myself last time. Javier Kiburos, I'm faculty in mechanical engineering and associate dean for the College of Engineering and Computer Science. The big question, I think a lot of people, the tougher question people have been asking is, uh, I know that this merger, some of the argument was economies of scale, but um, really the argument that, what, that people took to heart was that we were gonna better serve the valley, we were gonna better serve students. And so the question that, that uh, the deeper question people were asking was, besides buildings, what are the resources? Uh, are we just is just is this just a, a sum of parts because if all it is is sum of parts that's no new resources so the question is you were talking about budgets and, and question also going to to UT system and to the Board of Regents um, what new resources do we anticipate coming in that is going to facilitate I would hope all the visits that have been happening over the last couple of years between Regents and system Something that's very obvious on these two campuses is how under-resourced they are in particular. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Um, and, and, it, and it's a, you know, kind of a, a, a multi-variable type, type of answer. Um, but I guess we can start the premise of what my vision was. 
uh, in, in basically, you know, helping promote this concept to the legislature and to the board. So first of all, uh, I feel that, you know, this is one of the fastest growing regions in the state of Texas, and, um, you know, if we create the right infrastructure for UTRGV and really provide the promise that, you know, this in fact, you know, is on a pathway of an emerging research university, you know, can we, can we actually uh, retain more of our talent, you know, in the Valley and ultimately, you know, grow enrollment uh, at UTRGV. So, you know, whether we like it or not, enrollment growth is an important part of revenue, you know, for a campus based on uh, not only tuition, and we want to keep, you know, our affordability, uh, you know, our costs affordable to this region. Second, uh, it does draw down, you know, not immediately, but two years later, uh, formula funding, you know, which will be exceedingly important. Uh, what bothered me when I was president you know, and believe me, even the Health Science of San Antonio was resource restricted, is, is that the way the formulas work, if somebody else grows faster than you, even if you grew a little bit, you'd be cut because the formulas would be, you know, redistributed. Uh, so, so again, I think, in, you know, enrollment management is going to be an important part of that answer. The, the second aspect is... Uh, you know, if, if we can basically come together, you know, as a region and really, you know, establish, you know, a terrific vision for the Valley, then an area that's been relatively untapped, I'm, I may be criticized here a little bit, is, you know, really, and, and it's gotten better. Let, let, let me start off with that premise. But, but historically, you know, we have not really been focused a lot, you know, on philanthropy. And um, I, I do believe that the future of, of this region uh, and its economic future is going to lend itself to more philanthropic support for UTRGV. You can't transition a good, a, a good campus to a great campus without philanthropy. The third aspect is, you know, what can the Board of Regents do? Um, and, and this is a common question by every by 14 out of the 15 campuses, with the exception of UT Austin. Uh, the board is, you know, somewhat restricted, you know, in, in how they allocate operational funds because from, from the permanent university funds, uh, you know, AUF is distributed. AUF can really only go, you know, for operations to one campus, and that's UT Austin. But the board can provide important funds to uh, essentially help with uh, recruitments by providing, you know, better facilities, better equipment, uh, you know, better renovations, things that, you know, the campus itself hopefully doesn't have to expand. Uh, I think the STARS funding, you know, has also been an important <clears throat> part. I think the Regents Outstanding Teaching Awards, again, not recurrent money, but, you know, that, that is also, you know, significant funds that can help a faculty who gets that award. All right, so, so why then go, you know, to this pathway of at least getting on the track of becoming an emerging research university? Why do that? Uh, do we need to do that? You know, I, I think first of all, personally, I believe the Valley deserves, you know, an emerging research university, and God willing, at some point in time, a, you know, a research intensive university. But, from, from an economic perspective, does it make sense? The answer is yes. First of all, once you get into the pathway of an emerging research universities, there is a domino that clicks in the legislature. And that is, you suddenly become eligible for UTRIP funds, or, you know, which, which, or TRIP funding, which otherwise is not available to you. You become available as part of the Competitive Knowledge Fund, you know, which actually is operational funds. And you also become eligible for National Research University funds. So, you know, these are new revenue streams that can come down to UTRGV, but we've got to work to get there. And so, you know, again, probably not what you want to hear that, you know, this is going to happen overnight, but the vision allows more resources to come in. If I could add a couple of more 
Thanks. Uh, I, um, the other important piece is that uh, that with the medical school you're going to get a lot of um, a lot of uh, NIH funding. Typically, 50% of that revenue comes back to the university for to support research, to support faculty, to support students in many different ways. Um, if you at, at UT Austin, roughly 300 million dollars come in in indirect uh, costs, indirect funding you know, to, to the university. So it's, it's huge. And obviously, you're not going to get $300 million immediately, but, but fairly soon as the medical school and the sciences begin to work together, um, things will change. The other piece is that we have to be a little bit more uh, entrepreneurial. We can't just wait for, for the state of Texas or for the border regions or for other folks to generate funding. You are at a really prime place right now, at this moment, to, to send uh, education programs to Mexico, to Central America, to Latin America. And why couldn't you take advantage of this on the online, um, you know, online operations? I think you could make a lot of money. Uh, let me give you a little sense of how much money Colombia makes. And Colombia is in New York. It's about $90 million a year on online operations, selling certificates and selling programs, educational programs. So we got to think a little bit differently about uh, generating revenue as well. Can I add one more thing to that? I, I apologize for, you know, extending this answer, but, but I think it's important. It's interesting. There's one thing about funding in the state of Texas. You can do something about your funding. And remember, much of higher ed, uh, most of it is funded through funding formulas. And uh, you can do better than you're doing. When, when I got to, I'm not going to talk about old institutions very much, but I want to do this this one time. Uh, when I got to Texas Tech, their appropriations in the state legislature in 2009 were 50% below the average increase, the, the, the increase, in, and I think the state had added 7% to the formula. Tech got three. So we put a formula funding initiative in place to reverse that. In the 2013 legislative session, I think the increase was 8% and tax was 12%. We'll do the same thing here. Now, uh, the first thing uh, I did after I came on board was send Marty Baylor my plan for doing that. Uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to listen to it too because uh, when UTRGV starts up, I'll go to each of your units individually. We'll talk about this. The resource issue is we have some control over it and we'll do a good job. I know exactly what we should do how we can do it. It takes a lot of work, but we'll have some control over that. I, I'm well aware of, of salary issues and those other issues, and they don't have to be that way. And my job in working with you is to make sure that, that they're not. And so b building up those kinds of resources will be my primary task. By the way, Marty can share that PowerPoint with you sometime if you, if you just, if you want to put yourself to sleep at night. So, but uh, anyway, you can see kind of how we'll think about that. Those, those, that's a real issue, a real question, and it, it, it deserves our work and effort, so. We'll take one last question. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bailey. Thank you. My name is Greg Gilson. I'm a, a professor of philosophy here. And I want to ask um, uh, for your broad vision of the role of liberal arts and humanities in UTRGV. And just as a brief background, there's been three curriculum changes that would seem to diminish it, at least um, the role of liberal arts and humanities, at least you know, on a broad basis, non-humanities majors. The first one is the, the change in the core reduction of, of humanities hours. Um, the second one is the elimination of required minors, and a lot of you know, non-humanities majors would choose a humanities minor. And then the third one is the reduction in advanced hours. Um, and a lot of, again, non-humanities majors would um, choose to fulfill that requirement with humanities courses. So I'm just wondering broadly, how are we going to work in this new system to ensure a broad-based liberal arts humanities education in UTRGV? Well, that's a good question. Of course, you asked that to a former liberal arts dean. So, I mean, you know, that's kind of, <laughs> and, and an English major. I should also point out, you know, the ESPN is one of the big companies in the world. Everybody recognizes it. Head of ESPN is an English major from North Carolina. So I'll just a little plug there for, for English majors. I, anyway, it, the, if, you, if you look at, uh, at books like Academically uh, Adrift, they talk about uh, problems with 
people's learning about critical thinking. Liberal arts is very important in that. One of the things we want to make sure that our students do that they not, not only come out well trained in biology and psychology and engineering, but they, that they're good critical thinkers as well. The thing about liberal arts, your, your, your uh, degree ought to prepare you for a job, but your education ought to prepare you for a lifetime and for a career. And I think that's really where the liberal arts come in. And we need to keep in mind always that, that vision of uh, preparing people, not just for their first job, but their last one is, as well. And uh, if we do that, I, I think we can, the, the, the particular points about the curriculum, we can talk about uh, uh, in detail later. But that ought to give you some idea of my conception of liberal arts. Well, I think just, just to follow up um, is I was privileged to serve on you know, a Blue Ribbon Task Force assembled by the American Arts and Sciences on the future of the humanities and the arts um, in, in America. And you know, just like Guy Beatty stated, um, over, you know, the facts that we got is that over half of the CEOs of you know, Fortune you know, 500 companies actually end up you know, getting a degree in the humanities or the arts. And um, you know, also, this would be a pretty sad world without the humanities and the arts. And, and we're all you know, passionate about that. I'm actually you know, not an English major, but I'm a classical guitarist. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's exactly <laughs> I know that there's still a lot of questions out there and a lot of concerns and challenges, but also opportunities that we will confront as we create UTRGV. But as I said in my initial comments, this is, uh, this is part of an ongoing conversation. So there'll be many opportunities uh, to have these conversations, to have these discussions about UTRGV and the future as we move forward. Before we conclude, I also uh, want to recognize and thank uh, a another a great champion for UTRGV who represents the Rio Grande Valley and the Board of Regents, uh, Regent Aliceda, please stand and be recognized. And thank you very much. Thank you very much for your support. So uh, please, once again, help me thank uh, Dr. Guy Bailey, uh, uh, Dr. Pedro Reyes, and the Chancellor for being here with us and joining us in this conversation. Thank you all very much for being here. Have a great day.